two PVIS versus CRCM. This is the lecture for module three point two. Okay, so in this module, what we're basically going to do is we're going to apply uh, some critical pedagogy tenets to school climate, student social emotional development, and classroom management practices. Uh, and, and we will do this specifically by looking at positive behavioral interventions and supports and uh, culturally relevant classroom management. Okay, so we'll start with PBIS. Basically what PBIS is, is a large-scale behavioral management system um, that's set up to make schools uh, into more efficient operating spaces for teaching and learning. Some of the descriptors for PBIS include being a multi-tiered framework to make schools more effective places, um, proactive approach schools use to uh, improve school safety and implement more positive student behavior, uh, and a framework for um, seeking to reduce or eliminate poor behavior school-wide uh, by encouraging positive behavior. So the goals of PBIS include and some of this will be a little bit redundant, promoting uh, positive student behavior, strengthening students' social emotional skills, reducing disciplinary incidents, um, handling bullying, you know, reducing and eliminating bullying, increasing school safety, um, enhancing students' academic performance, and, and improving the overall um, school climate. And school climate is an important concept for us to address uh, because school climate is considered a research-based academic indicator, and they actually measure um, school climate and compare school climate to how students perform academically. School climate basically is just a representation of the character of school life based upon daily experiences of students, parents, and school personnel. <clears throat> School climate involves norms, values, and expectations that support uh, the social, emotional, and physical safety of students, family, and school personnel. Um, it, it, it promotes the idea or of engagement, that stakeholders are engaged and respected. Uh, promotes the concept of community development support for schools. Students, families, and educators work together. Uh, to develop a, a shared vision for what a school will be like and what the goals of the school will be. And that educators will mod model and nurture attitudes that emphasize uh, the benefits and satisfaction gained from learning. And also, finally, that each person contributes to the operation of the school and, and uh, the physical environment of the school. Okay, so school climate really takes more of a a community-based approach to looking at how um, schools function and how students, school staff, parents, and families feel about that particular school. Okay. Uh, PBIS structure, this pyramid represents how uh, school-wide PBIS operates. School-wide PBIS includes practices uh, and strategies that involve all students. That's highlighted by the green part of the triangle. Uh, then there are practices uh, that are designed and used with some students, uh, and this is generally those students for whom you know the, the generalized practices for the entire school are not working. And then, of course, um, there are those targeted practices for the few students who experience uh, significant behavioral issues. Uh, so all that's 100%. Uh, the strategies and practices uh, signified by some represent 5 to 20% of the student population and few that represents about 1 to 5% uh, of students in the school population. And those portions of the triangle are, are representative of tiers. Okay, so tier 1 is universal, covers 100% of the students, it involves all students. Um, and that's basically ground level teaching of pro social skills and behavioral expectations um, and acknowledge that there are behavioral expectations across all settings that involves in the classroom and in specials 
in the school hallway, in the cafeteria, at assemblies, on field trips. So in other words, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, there are behavioral expectations for you wherever you go and whatever you do. Tier 2 is targeted for 5 to 20 percent of the school population. This focuses on students who are not really successful with Tier 1. It involves additional teaching and practice opportunities and includes support that's offered to students within specific groups. So these students who are not, who, for whom um, Tier 1 supports are not working. Uh, tier 2 supports are developed and implemented. Tier 3 um, is more of an individual step. It involves 1 to 5 percent of the student population. This is more intensive support for students who are struggling and have behavioral challenges. Uh, it involves collecting data on students, academic strengths and deficits, um, and their physical and mental health needs and medical status and family and community supports. I've got the word deficits in bold and underlined because that connects with what we've been talking about in terms of um, think about students from a deficit perspective. So whenever we see that word or that concept, we have to acknowledge that and dig a little bit deeper to find out, you know, what's really going on here. Um, intervention for kids at, at Tier 3 include instruction routines, monitoring, um, daily check-ins, coordinating with families. Okay, so again, school-wide tiered levels. Now, while PBIS is a school-wide um, practice, there are classroom practices, PBIS classroom practices that can be uh, and, and are implemented as well. These include thoughtfully designing, designing the classroom environment, uh, developing and teaching routines, um, posting you know, clear teaching uh, classroom expectations, uh, using active supervision and proximity, uh, giving opportunities for students to respond, effective praise, uh, other strategies to encourage positive behavior and also correcting um, student behavior. So you've got the school-wide approach uh, to PBIS and then there are those practices that teachers are encouraged to get, engage in within their classroom. Just going to step back and take more of a broad view of PBIS from a statistical um, standpoint. Initial funding for PBIS was provided in 1998. Okay, so when we, we think about that, um, that helps us understand it, that PBIS has been in place for over 20 years. It's pretty broad and, and widely spread throughout the United States. There are more than 27,000 schools in the country. Um, that use PBIS. These are schools that have received funding, training, and support to implement PBIS. In the state of Georgia, there are over 1,400 schools that receive uh, PBIS training and supports. So PBIS is a, is a broadly used school-wide and classroom management system in the United States. Okay. In in terms of the research, you know there is research support. Um, for the following outcomes, but again, you know, this is this is very broad, and you, you have to look at this at a school uh, by school basis. So it's been associated with improved school culture, uh, social skills, reducing suspensions, um, improving school safety, improving academic performance, increasing family involvement, um, reducing office disciplinary referrals. Okay, um, and overall improving classroom management. So again, there's research that suggests this, uh, but this is a very, very broad view of PBIS. And as we go through this, this um, lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at PBIS and um, examine, you know, what has happened with students uh, from underserved groups within over the last 20 years in which PBIS has been used to see if these claims stack up. Okay. Now, important critiques of PBIS. Again, it's broadly used, widely accepted, uh, but there is a strong body of critique of PBIS. One of the challenges with PBIS is it's based on behaviorist principles. 
And um, behaviorism is a, a school of psychology that, that's really um, based on rewards, using rewards and punishments to shape behavior. And early research in behaviorism was conducted on animals, children, and also institutionalized adults. And this body of research has really been developed on groups that are dependent on people in power. Okay, so it supports sort of a dependent relationship in terms of, of institutions and people in power um, using their influence uh, to shape the behavior of people who don't have as much power as they do. Um, it's a behavior management, this is a, a very important critique. PBIS is a behavior management system that is largely rewards based. Okay, students are motivated and manipulated oftentimes by rewards and punishments. Um, another critique is that it prepares students to fit in as powerless subordinates, trains kids to fit in, um, and teaches kids basically to, to basically to be followers, um, so that you can get the reward and, and you know just do what is expected. It reinforces an asymmetric power dynamic between students and adults. Okay. It conditions kids to seek praise or extent, extrinsic motivation in school rather than developing internal drive and intrinsic motivation to do well in school. So again, you know, these are, are critiques and concerns that have been expressed about PBIS. Okay. Another concern about PBIS is that it promotes materialism. Students get used to doing the right thing, not because it's the right thing or because they want to do the right thing, but they do it for the reward. Another concern is that PBIS can be demeaning to students. For those kids who already are intrinsically motivated, the idea that they need some sort of outside motivation in order to um, engage in their studies or you know, develop positive relationships with other people is, is, is seen as demeaning and, and possibly disrespectful. Okay. Um, another important critique is that PBIS can promote labeling of students. Some students begin to see themselves as members of those permanent groups, you know, depending upon how PBIS is implemented in different settings. You've got kids who may see themselves as the green kids because, you know, pretty much they do what they're supposed to do and they respond well to those instructional um, behavioral goals that they receive. Then you may have kids who start seeing themselves as red kids because they get in trouble a lot because they have not really um, mastered uh, the behavioral expectations and they are having some, some, some issues and some challenges. So there's that, that threat of or that concern about labeling. And another critique is that PBIS is heavily promoted by the United States Department of Education. Um, that gives it an unfair advantage of, over other programs uh, that are in existence and, and, and that people would like to try to use um, to create a more pro-social school environment. And some districts and, and, and some leaders have a problem with PBIS because they sort of see it as a national curriculum you know, that's coming from the federal government and that, that's being... Um, promoted, you know, over local ideas and local plans um, to create positive school environments. A major critique of PBIS is that there's been a, a real disregard and exclusion um, for addressing race, culture, gender, and socioeconomic factors um, that help shape school communities and influence student engagement and behavior. Very little guidance on issues of diversity, equity, and social justice. Um, the major problem PBIS has been in existence for over 20 years, but there are still significant levels of disproportionality um, in terms of exclusionary disciplinary practices. And as an example, uh, black students make up about 15% of the population of students in U.S. public schools, but constitute over 31% of school-based arrests. You know, um, that's major that that's hugely problematic and again you know these kinds of disparities continue to exist in an environment where PBIS is widely promoted okay um, 
Another important aspect of this critique is that teachers are not required to receive training and support in any of the following areas, multicultural education, culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally relevant teaching, teaching students from diverse populations, restorative practices. So all of these elements are left out of the process of, of training and supporting um, teachers to learn and understand how to implement PBIS. And that, that's this, I'm, I'm making this statement as PBIS was uh, originally um, designed and developed. Okay. So again, we think about the fact that PBIS has been in place over the last 20 years and we still have these disparities. We you know, need to make sure we're looking at uh, what some of the data says. Okay, in terms of disparities in school suspensions, um, as compared to overall school population representation, uh, black students are overrepresented by 23%. Boys are overrepresented by 18%, and students with disabilities are overrepresented by 13%. This connects with what we talked about last week um, in terms of critical special education, some of the data that we looked at. So again, this, these, these are the percentages by which these particular groups are overrepresented um, in terms of school suspensions. What I wanted to do this week was kind of sort of give the data, but flip it a little bit, represent it a little bit differently. Uh, these are disparities in, in a range of disciplinary actions as compared to um, representation within the overall school population. So again, out of school suspensions, black students overrepresented by 23%. In school suspensions, black students overrepresented by 16%. Referral to law enforcement, black students overrepresented by 10%. Expulsions, black students overrepresented by 15%. Corporal punishment, black students overrepresented by 22%. We think of corporal punishment um, those are those extreme and often abusive behaviors that are actually still legally allowed in some school districts. You do realize that in some school districts, it's still legal um, to spank students. Uh, so, yeah, cor corporal punishment still exists in the United States, and um, black students are disproportionately targeted. School-related arrests, black students, 19%. So, again, just, just striking. Um, major disparities in discipline, and this is within the context of PBIS being used at schools throughout the United States. Now, this particular statistic I wanted to present, because I kind of wanted to sort of um, flip the script a little bit and get you to look at uh, disparities from a different perspective. This looks at days of lost instruction due to out-of-school suspensions. This is very, very important. Because when we talk about disparities and suspensions and expulsions, we talk about it because when students miss class time, they miss instruction. When students miss instruction, they fall behind academically. When students fall behind academically, they become less engaged in school. When students become less engaged in school, a lot of times they start having behavioral challenges. When students fall behind and become uh, disengaged from school, they don't do as well. They may end up, you know, uh, dropping out or, or actually being pushed out of school. Um, or they, they, they just may not finish, you know, and end up quitting and, 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 and doing something else. Or they may finish, but, you know, barely and, and struggle academically. So this is an important um, statistic for us to look at. Black students lost 103 days per 100 students enrolled. That's 82 more days than the 21 days their white peers lost due to out-of-school suspension. Wine in Pacific Island students had the second highest rate of 63 days lost per 100 students enrolled. Native Americans came in at 54 days per 100 students. So each of these three groups, Native Americans, Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and um, black students, uh, lost significantly more instructional time out of the classroom as a result of suspensions and expulsions than their white counterparts. Students with disabilities at the secondary lost, secondary level lost 68 days per 100 students. 
So again, this is a problem for students with disabilities as well. Now, all that taken together, um, presentation and discussion of PBIS and examination of the disparities that, that continue to exist, uh, we have to acknowledge that efforts have been made to make PBIS more culturally responsive. Uh, data shows that PBIS models initial admission of frameworks and practices that deal with race, culture, and socioeconomic considerations have, have exacerbated uh, the problem of disproportionality. So one of the things that, that people have done, you know, over the last 10 years or so is they've made adjustments to try to make uh, PBIS more culturally responsive. We've got models like culturally responsive positive behavior interventions and supports, um, cultural responsiveness and school-wide PBIS, uh, culturally responsive approaches to PBIS, PBIS cultural responsive field responsiveness field guide. So you you, you see various uh, attempts and steps. Um, to acknowledge the fact that race and, and, and culture and socioeconomic status are factors that have an impact on students and how students are perceived and how students are treated in schools and that it needs to be addressed. Um, but it's sort of like uh, the tail wagging the dog or, you know, the cow being already out of the barn, you know, and trying to go back and, and take some corrective actions by including the cultural responsiveness in the work of creating PBIS schools and classrooms. Okay, so that brings us to culturally responsive classroom management. Culturally responsive classroom management, or CRCM, um, basically it's it's a, an approach to running classrooms and schools uh, with all children um, in a culturally responsive way. All kids are in mind. It's not just a set of strategies and practices. CRCM is really more of a pedagogical approach. Uh, the guides manage the decisions that teachers make. Uh, important factor is that it's a natural extension of culturally responsive teaching. And as such, it uses students' backgrounds, renderings of social experiences, prior knowledge and learning styles, in daily instruction, relationship building, and management practices. In uh, CRCM, focus uh, is on strategies that help develop the classroom for all students. Okay. Uh, teachers use their cultural awareness to guide management decisions that are made. Um, and CRCM accounts for and incorporates the following factors into instructional and management decisions. Students' backgrounds, students' home lives, their cultural capital, learning preferences, multiple intelligence, their assets, their funds of knowledge. So we've been working with you on these things throughout this semester. Um, so these are our central tenets and components of culturally responsive management practices. So you use them in your instruction, you use them in your management. When you think about it, teaching and management are, are, are wedded. You know, they're, they're not, I teach and I manage, really um, the two practices should come together smoothly. And CRCM gives you a pedagogical framework from which to make. Okay. Um, and as we talk about those disparities uh, that are persistent, this is this is a very important consideration for CRCM. What it does is it seeks to provide all students with equitable opportunities for learning. Uh, by minimizing discriminatory discipline practices that occur when the behaviors of non-dominant populations are misinterpreted. Okay, so CRCM gives us a chance to take some to take corrective action and come up with management practices that will keep students of color and um, keep students from diverse backgrounds from being targeted. Uh, by the disciplinary practices that are used in many schools in the United States. Uh, elements of CRCM include recognizing one's own cultural lens and biases, uh, acknowledging students' cultural backgrounds, um, being aware of the broader social, economic, and political context within uh, which kids live. And you can't teach kids if, if you're not aware 
of the social, economic, and political factors and community-based factors that are affecting them, because that affects students at home. Um, it affects their belief systems. Uh, it affects their state of mind when they come to your classroom. So being aware of all these things is very important. Um, it also involves an ability and willingness to use culturally appropriate management strategies and a strong commitment to building a caring classroom. Okay, some examples of culturally relevant, uh, culturally responsive, I'm sorry, classroom management practices, uh, monitoring your discourse style, um, figuring out whether you need to be direct or indirect with your students, depending upon their cultural backgrounds, the tone you use with your students, issues like proximity and personal space. That's very important. These are cultural factors, and people from different groups um, have different expectations in terms of proximity and personal space. Um, that can also include things like facial expressions and, and body language as well. These are cultural things. We have to figure out how uh, the way we use things, these uh, factors may affect students. We also have to think about terminology. And what kind of terminology um, will we use? And are the things that we say at home and in our communities, um, if we say them, will students understand them? Or if we say them, how will they respond? Okay, and this is, it's relationship building. It's also trial and error. You know, you're going to make some mistakes. That's fine. But the, the important thing is to observe your mistakes, acknowledge them, and make the changes that you need to make. Clarify expectations, what needs to be accomplished, time frames, helping somebody. Uh, let me slow down. Helping someone as opposed to doing the work for someone, too. Um, this is important in your reaction, in your interaction with students, but also in, in very important um, when you have students working in groups so that you can teach them what the difference between the two is. Okay, uh, examples of culturally responsive classroom management practices um, include being sensitive to how uh, people from or students from diverse uh, cultures manage conflict. People from different groups manage conflict very differently. Um, and conflict resolution and, and addressing conflict can be uh, different based on race, based on uh, socioeconomic status or class, and also based on culture and ethnicity. Okay, So these are things that, that you have to research. These are things that you have to learn from your interactions. Um, and these are things that you will learn from some of the mistakes that you make. Emphasizing a positive and welcoming environment that's very, very critical. Um, students need to feel welcome, comfortable, and safe in your presence and in your classroom. Um, a culturally responsive management strategy you can use is humor. But I, I, I do say this. Humor is tricky. Humor is cultural. What's funny to one group may not be funny to another group. Um, so I would suggest really getting to know your students um, who they are, listening to how they interact um, before you begin, you know, to, to using a lot of humor. Because humor can be disrespectful um, to students, uh, depending upon how it's used. Okay. So in terms of CRM, CRCM, the focus is on student engagement. Okay, very traditional classroom and school management practices are really more disciplinary focused. You know, you're working with students, they do something wrong, they get punished, period. PBIS is really more reward and routine focused. Okay, teaching those basic behavioral skills, um, building in a system of rewards to um, support. Uh, positive uh, the the exhib the exhibition of positive behaviors. So that's the PBIS framework. For CRCM, the focus is on engagement, on uh, engaging in culturally responsive teaching. You know, making the classroom an interesting and an exciting exploratory experience, um, basing students' ex uh, learning experiences, and, and wedding student strengths and assets and cultural capital into um, your instruction. 
basically doing everything you can to make your class an exciting and an engaging place. When students are engaged, they're a lot less likely to have behavioral problems. So again, the focus of CRCM is on student engagement. Now engagement is kind of tricky um, because there are, are different kinds of engagement. And in terms of, of student engagement, there's really no one particular set definition that everybody agrees on. Um, and this is an important idea from a CRCM perspective. Uh, engagement assumes that students are not objects to be molded, controlled or disciplined, but are human subjects of action and responsibility. So in other words, uh, under CRCM, students are seen as people who have free will, um, who can make choices and, and, and make decisions and that they bring those to the classroom when they, when they come to school or when they work with you online as we're doing during this COVID pandemic. There are three aspects of engagement that um, you need to be aware of if you're going to practice CRCM. Um, there, there's behave, there are behavioral aspects of engagement. These are the things that we can observe in terms of students' interactions and actions at school. There are emotional aspects of engagement. These center the interests, values, and feelings towards school that students have. They may not necessarily be apparent, but they're there. So when, when kids are emotionally engaged in school, they will come, they will be there. Um, they may not do as well academically um, as you expect them to or as you'd like for them to do, but school is still an important place for them to be. Then, of course, there are the cognitive accent, aspects. Uh, this takes form in terms of students' motivation and, and effort that they display. Okay, so three levels of engagement that we need to be aware of. Okay. As such, engagement awareness is an important uh, practice used by uh, CRCM practitioners. And something to remember is that students are not always engaged equally across all three areas of engagement. Okay. Um, so in order to figure this out and determine this, you've got to get to know your students. Getting to know them, watching them, working with them, interacting with them, teaching them, that will let you know whether they're engaged or not, whether they're engaged or disengaged. And it'll also give you an idea of what type or what types of engagement um, they're demonstrating. Uh, and also, it's important to develop practices and strategies that help you get at the root of a student's disengagement. And the only way you can really do that is by building a positive relationship with students to the point where you can have those kinds of um, frank conversations either with the student or with a parent. Okay, another important point is that uh, kids who come from homes uh, where the values resemble the dominant school culture are more likely to feel engaged in school and have positive relationships. Students who are outside of the dominant culture sometimes come to school with an oppositional attitude. Okay, we have to remember that school has not been a great experience for everybody and that sometimes we have students whose parents who really struggled and had bad experiences in school and they maybe have passed those off to their students um, in one way or another. So we have to remember that too. And as teachers, we have to kind of undo that so that the, ch the children can have positive experiences in school and use those to learn and grow. Um, CRCM also challenges us to work collaboratively to get to know students so that we can understand, you know, where they're engaged, where they're disengaged, and make adjustments accordingly. A very important point, too, is that CRCM requires humanizing relationships in school. Okay, we talk, we, pretty much we've talked about uh, humanizing relationships with students this entire semester. But here are some specific things we can do to humanize our relationship with students. Now, humanizing is one of those words we often talk about, but sometimes I think we need examples. So some examples would include uh, providing scaffolding during teaching, you know, making sure that um, you're able to, to teach students, you know, 
uh, in phases, you know, so that they learn a skill and, and they learn material and then you're able to build on that and expand on their learning. And when you scaffold with students and teach in a way, you know, where you're giving them opportunities to, to learn and to build their knowledge and you're working closely with them to help them uh, fill gaps in their learning, um, that's a great way to demonstrate that you, you see kids as human beings, that you care about them, that you're going to take the time to teach them effectively and take the time to give them the building blocks that they need, you know, to learn and grow. Um, displaying a kind of disposition towards your students through your actions. I call that being a warm demander. I, I like that term because I think sometimes we misinterpret what it means to be kind. And, and sometimes we think about kindness to the point where um, we allow ourselves to become pushovers. And that's one thing that we don't want you to do in your classroom is to be a pushover with students. Okay, so you see yourself as a warm demander. I care about you, uh, but it's also my job and my goal, you know, to, to challenge you and, and, and to push you and to teach you with rigor, you know. Um, so, yes, you know, I love you. I'm here for you, but you know, we have work to do, and the work that we do, we take seriously, okay? Um, availability to help students uh, and provide academic support inside and outside of the classroom, um, that's a great way to um, humanize students. When I first started teaching in Baltimore, I, I taught at a really, you know, tough uh, middle school um, in Baltimore, and there was one teacher there, she was an amazing math teacher, and she would spend, I would say, about a half hour at least every day after school in her classroom, and she would always have about 10 students in her room around her desk asking her questions and getting help with different problems, and it was the most amazing thing, you know, to watch. It was my first year and I was young and I was still struggling trying to figure everything out. I would just look at her and I'm like, wow. You know, um, but that was her way of humanizing students. She took the time to work with them and support their learning after school and they loved it. And they, you know, they would go back for it every day. So it's a great way to humanize students. Showing personal interest in students and well-being inside of school and uh, outside of um, Inside the classroom, outside of the classroom, and also outside of school. Um, you can do that by going to and participating in some of their extra, extracurricular activities and events. That's a powerful way to, to show students that you're interested in them and that you care about them. Okay. Um, also, providing uh, effective academic support uh, is an important way to humanize students. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, if, um, a set of practices that I, I, I wanted to introduce you to in our discussion of cultural responsive classroom management. And I just want to take some time and talk about um, implementing restorative practices in the classroom. Okay, and you may have heard about restorative practices, but we'll break it down a little bit today. Restorative discipline is an approach to classroom management that comes from our restorative justice philosophy. Uh, restorative justice uh, maintains that schools should be places where kids are able to make mistakes, reflect and upon and learn from these mistakes, and correct these mistakes as they continue to grow and learn. It also maintains that students um, who engage in behaviors that harm them or themselves should be moved toward the support structures that they need to help them make better futures choices instead of being sent out of school or suspended or expelled. You know, so in other words, what can we do to support and help kids who, you know, are making bad decisions and doing things that are either hurting them or themselves? What can we do to support them so that they can get the help they need and hopefully begin to make better choices and decisions rather than taking a purely punitive approach? Also, with uh, restorative practices, students are given an opportunity to reflect and grow from errors in judgment and conflict without necessarily being punished, sent out of the classroom, you know, for disciplinary reasons. And 
students are treated as responsible yet imperfect community members. You know, we don't expect perfection out of people. You know, we expect improvement and growth, but it's important to understand that, that students are imperfect and they're going to make mistakes. Okay, uh, here are three examples of restorative classroom practices that you can use. You can use effective language, that's least formal, used with all students. You can use a circle process, that's a group process that helps strengthen relationships and discuss issues and resolve conflicts. And then there are conferences. These are um, more individualized session to work with individual students. Then broken relationships. It should be used when serious harm has been committed or when students are in personal crisis. We've got the upside down triangle to represent the fact that um, effective learning is something that can, you can use with all your students in your classroom. Uh, circle process is something that you can use with smaller groups of students depending upon what the situation is. And conferences are designed to help students who are experiencing particular challenges in the classroom work through their issues. Okay, so effective language. Um, this can again be used with the greatest number of students. It um, doesn't really require any special training. It just requires that you challenge yourself in terms of how you communicate as a teacher. Basically, it, it's just kind of the, the statements or questions that you make to express feelings. Um, that are related to behavioral actions of others. Uh, it affirms positive behavior and redirects unwanted behavior. It helps underst students understand how their actions affect each other. And here's just a, a little quick script to help you understand how it works. Um, so it's a situation where somebody took the snack off of Maya's desk. You could ask, what were you thinking about when you took Maya's snack off of the desk? How do you think she's been affected? What do you think you need to do to make the situation right? This allows a student to take responsibility without being sent out of the classroom or sent to the office. You're acknowledging that the student did something wrong. You're having a conversation about it, and you're giving the student an opportunity to make amends so it doesn't become a situation that blows up and that, that the child doesn't have to be sent out of the classroom. That's a huge problem is we have too many children who are being sent out of the classroom for minor infractions that can be dealt with right in our own classrooms and through the relationships we build with students. Okay, um, another practice you can use is the circle process. Um, you can have students sit in a circle, and this is you know for situations that involve a larger number of students. Um, have situations where students sit in a, have students sit in a circle. Um, have the facilitator that, that can be the teacher or, you know, if you have taught students how to use circles, it can actually be the student. Um, the facilitator makes an introduction and reminds the group of common values. You know, everybody in the circle is connected. Each person has a right to his own beliefs. And we focus on accountability, honesty, responsibility, and compassion. The facilitator poses a question. Participants take turn talking. One person speaks at a time. Uh, some participants can choose not to speak if they don't want to. Facilitator opens and closes the, the, the circle process. So again, this is a group conversation. It's designed to get at a root, the root of a challenge or an issue that has taken place in the classroom. Okay. Uh, and then the group conferences. Okay. Um, this is for a smaller number of students. Generally, it's for the student or student that was involved um, in the situation or in the infraction or in whatever it is that happened it can be involved school personnel uh, and in some cases family members depending upon what is taking place. And basically what you're doing is you're using open-ended student-centered questions and prompts uh, to help students talk and, and, and repair broken relationships. Uh, takes more time to plan because you have to really figure out the logistics of what you're going to do and the specific questions that you're going to ask based on what happened. And you get involved parties discuss what happened and why and how each person feels and what can be done to make the situation right. So here are some questions that you can incorporate into um, the group conference. Tell me what happened. Um, what was your part in what happened? Okay, so it's just kind of fact-finding, talking with the student. 
then you can ask, what were you thinking at the time? Now, that's a tricky question because sometimes, many times we ask somebody what they were thinking. There, there's a pejorative nature to it. So it's like, what were you thinking? You know, what, what were you thinking about? So we have to be careful that we don't say it like that and, and that we, we talk about it from more of an objective perspective. We just ask, you know, what were you, what were you thinking at the time? Okay. How were you feeling at the time? Who else was affected by this? What have you been? What have been your thoughts uh, since the incident took place? What are your thoughts now? How are you feeling now? What do you do to make? Need, what do you need to do to make things right? That's a key restorative um, practices question. It's just so important for us to give students an opportunity to either in their own way or through a, a, a decision that is made within a group or by an administrator or school personnel, it's important to give students an opportunity to uh, rectify the situation in meaningful ways. And then, of course, there's what can we do to support you? You know, this is a way, okay, so we've had this process, we've asked these questions, we've acknowledged that what has happened is a problem. But by asking what can we do to support you, we're letting this individual know that you're still a part of the community. Okay. Yes, you made a mistake. Yes, you did something that had a negative impact on someone else, but you're still a part of this community. And that's a great way to affirm students, to humanize students, and let them know that you're important and that you matter. And then, of course, is what might you do differently if this situation happens again? You know, so, again, um, just a few strategies uh, to help you understand how you can begin to implement restorative practices in your classroom. Okay, and it's, it's a really good representation of or an extension of culturally responsive classroom management. I think having examples to work with is very important. It's one thing to frame things theoretically and to give statistics. It's another thing to kind of chip away at it and provide people with tools to use. Okay, so basically key takeaways from this lecture. These are some of the things that I want you to just hold on to uh, as we wind this one down. Uh, first of all, PBIS and CRCM are two different philosophical and pedagogical approaches to teaching behavior and supporting students' needs and, and, and learning and building community. Uh, again, PBIS has been in place over 20 years, yet significant disparities in school disciplinary practice and outcome, out, academic outcomes um, along racial lines still persist. So we've got this model that we pour a lot of money into and that we spend a lot of time on, but we're still having the same problems. What do we need to be doing differently? Um, CRCM provides educators with an alternative pedagogical approach that can and should be used in 21st century classrooms. Um, and again, CRCM is for everybody. It's not just for students of color and students from diverse backgrounds. It's for everybody. Everybody. Uh, but it is important to acknowledge, too, acknowledge too, that the population of students in the U.S. schools is becoming increasingly diverse, even in the suburbs and rural areas. Okay. Also, educators must find ways to engage students um, that are not punitive and that we also allow students to grow and develop academically, cognitively, and behaviorally. And I think this last point is very important. CRCM and PBIS are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I realize some of you teach um, in PBIS schools or may get a job in a PBIS school. That's fine. But you can still be a culturally responsive classroom manager even within the framework of a PBIS school. And one of the good things, again, that's happening is that PBIS practice Practitioners and planners are realizing that um, the culturally responsiveness piece is missing, and they're going back and attempting to um, interject that back into PBIS. So again, these are just some key takeaways. Uh, I hope this has been beneficial, and I look forward to engaging with you about this uh, when we meet on Tuesday evening.